you everyone for coming. So today I'll speak about abusing Behat, just in a sense of how to stop F5 testing. And, and when I say F5 testing, I mean you change a bit of code, start F5 in your Firefox, Chrome or whatever, see that it works, there's some more code and that. So my name is Miros Vertan. So I presume that some of you know me as uh, one of the Zuge PHP organizers, and I'm also a web developer, a lazy one. And when I say lazy, I have even Bill Gates saying that it's sometimes really good to be lazy because lazy people will build difficult products in an easy way, and I like memes. So, so when we out. I've decided to do a bit of a introduction into the whole idea of testing. So I wanted to know, do you test your code? Can you like raise your hands? Whoever tests your up, 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 up. Like at the same time, everybody, like something. Okay, so what I often hear is that people don't test code when they are talking about testing. And it's actually, in 99% of the cases that we actually all do te are testing our stuff. It's only the difference between manual testing or having actual tests somewhere to run them. So yeah, you just write code and deploy it. I don't think so. So for years, I had, let's say, two excuses why not to use automated testing. The first one was writing tests takes a lot of time, a lot of resources, and we don't have that luxury. I've been using automated testing now for nine months, all the way, all the time, and I can tell you that Manual testing took much more time and resources than this does. The second one was, who's going to pay for it? Like, so if you do a client project, you say, okay, we're going to charge you 100 hours of development, but who's going to pay for those 10, 15, 20, 25 hours additionally to test? If you look at it from the perspective that you actually, in the development, have to test, you are already charging for it. And yes, my clients were always already paying for getting a good quality product. Often I hear from some smaller companies or developers working on smaller projects that I don't need tests that why would they improve some quality, clients are not paying for it. So as I'm thinking about buying a car, I took this as a idea, like this on the left costs like 15,000 euros, this nice Mercedes costs 100,000 euros. Does that mean if I buy the left one, that I'll be stuck with like doors don't close, you can't open windows, it won't start if it's night or lights will work only on weekends? No, and like you have a window that's watching into the wall, so you have one job. Or I'm sorry that it's hard to see, but this is the fro freezing part that you can't open because of the doors. So yeah, or you just put the bags of candy in the machine instead of opening the can and putting them in, or this like a railing over the door. Like, no, do you really want to, I really don't want to be a dever developer like that. So, in my experience, the testing, it actually reduced my stress levels and my frustration because I would always in the middle of the project find out that, well, we haven't thought of that case or maybe a client would change the behavior, would change the requirements or something like that. I presume that this is something that happens to all of you. Am I like, right? Anybody? In... Never. Never. <laughs> so it really helps. It saves time and increases productivity. 
Uh, this is something that was really strange for me too at the beginning to see that this actually helps, that this actually happens. And this ha happens at the point where you stop learning the test tool that you're using. So it actually empowered me to try new things. So let's say you have a, you're building some kind of product and you want to use somebody else's library. And for years, I didn't want to use uh, uh, some third-party libraries because, well, they change. They change from 1.5 to 2 so much that I have to then spend like a week trying to fix the differences. I would be running on a very old, old code. So in, my, in one of my last projects, uh, we were using Symfony 2.3. We couldn't migrate to 2.456, and I think that 2.7 is going out now because they changed how Symfony forms work between 2.3 and 2.4. And I was really not ready to waste a month trying to find all of those forms and fix them. So because I didn't have tests on there on that, on that side, where we were stuck on 2.3. Yes, it took some extra time in the beginning, but it paid off quickly. It's an investment. Take it as an investment. So, when we start talking about automated test testing, this is an old saying that I tried to convert from Croatian to English, that smart people write down, stupid try to remember. and. For years, I tried to remember all the cases for a feature and try to test them manually. So let's look at a login process. Uh, I presume that all of you have done the login at some point and that this is a simple enough, uh, simple enough case. <coughs> so for users to log in, their username and passwords must match. If a user doesn't enter username, you want to show a notice that please enter your username. Or if they don't enter a password, you want to say please enter your password. If they don't enter any of it, you want to say something else like please enter your username and passwords together. What if usernames or passwords don't match? You want to say please enter your username slash passwords. Again, they were not correct. Users must be active to log in. If user is not yet activated, you might want to send, uh, show them, okay, please, we've sent you an email, please uh, click on the activation link. Maybe user is disabled, you want to say, tell them, please contact us by email or phone, your account is disabled for whatever reason. Okay, maybe a successful login should redirect user back to the page where they clicked login link. So let's say that you are trying to buy something and you found the book you want to buy. You click login there. You want to log in after login to be back there, not on the home page, and then find the book again. So this was a simple process, and I didn't even include that users can check it, check remember me using third party like Facebook Connect, Google or GitHub. Two-factor authentication, users can use email address to log in, consider that user might be banned for some time if you're running like a forum or something. You, can, you should block IPs if somebody is trying to brute force your username, password or just some username. So it doesn't look that simple any, anymore, doesn't it? And you, six months later, you find yourself that you have to implement some new feature. Let's say users can use their email address instead of username to log in. Or maybe that ad users with admin privileges cannot use that login link, that they have to use some separate, separate one. Uh, with having automated tests, you get better code maintainability because you can just read them, you can just run them and see that your changes haven't destroyed anything from before. And that saves a lot of time. 
also. It's easier to transfer knowledge from one person to another because you might have been the person doing the login six months before, but now it's a junior developer or your colleague because you're on vacation or something. How many of you can now say those nine rules from the first slide to your fellow colleague? It's been like five minutes. Really? Want to try it? No. And this helps, really. And okay, somebody will say, well, we have 700 pages of documentation, so we have that sorted. But let's say you had also tests. Instead of verifying all of the old rules manually by clicking, okay, my username, my email, will this happen? You just run them automatically. That's it. It takes a minute instead of a few hours and possibly even if you produced some bugs, then it can take you maybe a day or two to just uh, clean them out. And just add the new rules into the mix because I'm lazy. I really like this, this principle. So let's start talking about Behat. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds to read it. get the volunteer to explain this test, what it does. Anybody? Okay, who understands this test? Please raise your hand. Okay, some of you are a bit shy and okay, but this is the idea of Behat. Uh, so why Behat? The tests are human readable. Uh, even your non-developers can write them, can read them. So you have a project manager, a client, maybe a QA team member, fellow developer, or somebody else, and they don't need to learn a new uh, domain-specific language. It's English. Okay, they have to look maybe at some other examples to get the idea of how to write them, but PHP Storms, uh, Storm has auto-complete on them. Uh, it's not so complicated. So what is Behat? It's a behavior-driven development framework. It's built in PHP and usually you run it as a uh, CLI script or just a call to bin Behat. You can find more details on the Behat page. And so the Behat's DSL is actually Gherkin. It's a, lang it's a DSL built for Cucumber. It's a Ruby test, too, Ruby test tool. So actually you can use this test in Python, in Ruby, in whatever uh, language or platform that supports Gherkin. And if I am correct, it's most of them. So what is Gherkin? Blah, 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 something. I wanted to see, uh, to put some text on it for, if you want to g get more details, but the second sentence or the second paragraph is the, the most important one. It serves as your project documentation as well as your automation tool. And that's the whole idea. You don't have to write separate documentation explaining in 50 pages what is happening and when. Write them here. So what is BDD? It's the idea that you set up uh, your human readable tests or scenarios or requirements, all of them, or at least part of them, and then you start uh, and then you start developing. I'm not going to talk about BDD and I'm going to actually throw away the whole idea of BDD now. I want to talk to you about using Behat just as a browser testing tool. Not sell you on BDD or something else. Just the idea of using it as a, one of your test tools. So why? We all have untested legacy code. Uh, it's easy to set up, use, understand, and it's actually a possible gateway for you to later to become a BDD pr practitioner if you want. But again, concentrating on the browser, 
tonight, uh, today. So it's language agnostic. It doesn't care what is your application written in PHP, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, whatever. Okay, for some advanced custom stuff, you'll need some basic PHP knowledge to add, customize, and stuff like that. But also, it's framework agnostic. It doesn't care if you're using Ye, uh, Ye WordPress, Symfony, Zend, Laravel, whatever, Cake PHP, whatever you're using. So, how I've been using it up to now. I run it on my local dev and on, my, on the continuous integration server. Uh, I keep the features in the same repo where the code is. You don't have to. You can uh, have a separate git repo or something like that somewhere else and just uh, just allow the access from that repo or from wherever to your application. All it needs is actually an HTTP access, nothing more than that. Uh, I have it integrated into Symfony 2 because I have some additional steps that access database. Like, let's say on registration, we had a unique, we had a unique on email. So if I would be running the same test twice, it would fail because it would be trying to enter another user using already uh, existing email. So I had to do some additional integrations. You can also, you can just connect to your database and delete, or you can put an endpoint that will do it or something like that. You don't actually have to integrate it into your application directly. So to be able, actually communicate with browsers, scrapers, and everything else, it uses Mink. It's a browser controller slash emulator for web applications. Here's a link if you want to learn more. Uh, I heard that now PHP Unit is also using it to access browser. So Mink supports I think like seven or eight different drivers, but I'll concentrate now on two of them. One is Gout and the second one is Selenium too. Uh, there are five more, so what's the main difference between them? So Gout is a screen scraping, it's, it's actually a PHP library that connects to your application endpoint and just grabs HTML and parses it out. So it's not a browser. It doesn't try to be a browser. It's just like curl, but a bit smarter because it parses HTML down. It's very fast. Unfortunately, it doesn't support JavaScript and you can't produce screenshots. Like, if you're using a browser test, if your tests fail, you can actually create a screenshot and save it somewhere. So you can look, okay, my test failed. Let's look why. You see the page and see that like, oh, there was some error that I didn't see or this element isn't visible or something like that. Okay, Selenium 2 driver. Uh, how many of you have ever tried Selenium? Okay, how many of you have heard of Selenium? Okay, I've tried Selenium for a few months. It was, I needed to use, I needed to learn the new DSL. It's much more technical than, much more technical tool, much more complicated DSL than the Behatz one. So if you run, if you're writing your Beha tests in the way as I show you, it's, go, it's gonna just use Selenium 2 to run them. It's going to uh, be able to do almost everything that a human can do. It can run JavaScript, it can create screenshots. You can use a headless browser, you can run then your tests on actual Chrome, Chromium or Firefox to be sure that it actually works. Uh, you can support different screen widths and heights. So you can test that your application behaves the same on a mobile phone, on a tablet, on a normal screen or some 30 inch monster. Okay, how to install it? Uh, who of you is already using Composer? Okay, so uh, you need to install Behat. I think that the minimal dependency is 5.4, 5 at least to run Mink or something like that, but 
I think that it can actually be run even on 5.3. Uh, to use to test JavaScript or use browsers, you need to actually install Selenium and uh, browsers themselves, which is a bit more complicated, but there are like billion tutorials on the Google. So. This is the composer JSON. You can update your own composer JSON, you can build a new one. Whatever it all it needs is a behat. I suggest using 3.0 version. Uh, if you start Googling a bit of documentation, there were some breaking changes between 2.5 and 3. So if you're like me and just copy pasting stuff from the internet and they don't work, look if, look if they were using 2.5. These five li libraries, PHP cons Composer, install, update, or whatever. That's it. Okay, now we have to actually configure Behat and tell what to do and how. So you have test suites. Uh, I prefer you don't have to. I use three of them. Web is just using the scraper, so it's really fast, and wherever I don't have JavaScript, I'm okay with it. I don't care for the screenshots, and it's gonna work for more or less everything. JavaScript, I use browser, so I separate them by adding the tags like, okay, web is everything that doesn't have a JavaScript tag or VIP tag, JavaScript test suits have JavaScript but are not VIP, and the last one is a work in progress tag. So whenever I'm working on a new feature, if I start breaking tests, I, match, I tag them as a VIP, as a work in progress, and then run just them until I get them working. And then I again start running all of them. If I break something, just tag them. So instead of like seven minutes, it takes like 20 seconds to run all of them. It of course all depends on how many tests you have, how many of them are JavaScript and stuff like that. Okay, now let's configure Mink. You say base URL. As you, as you can see, this is an open source project that I'm testing from my machine. It Really, all it needs is an HTTP access. You can actually test Facebook using it, if you want, or whatever application you, you desire. You, de you set up sessions, so default is the one that will be using Gout, the web scraper that I mentioned. JavaScript ones are going to use Selenium 2. Browser name is Firefox. You can use, if you prefer Chrome or Chromium, go for it. And that's it. Okay, uh, on the readability side, uh, so this is the explanation of the scenario. So what, what are we testing? And th these four are called steps. So what to do at what, what point? So you can do it two different ways and I'll try to explain what's a bit different and it will be your preference. So here I say given, given I am on the home page, and I click sign up, I see some kind of text on my registration form, and I should be on the registration form. Uh, the first and the last steps are custom. Uh, you have to add them to your context. I'll show you how to add them. It's really easy, but I prefer to avoid them, and I go this way. I say given I am on slash, which, which is actually a home page, then I click sign up, I should see registration form, and I should be on registration. This means that I don't have to build additional steps into my contexts, just can use the default one. Uh, since I've been using only Behat with technical personnel, it's not a problem. I don't know if your project managers or clients will understand the difference, so try to Try, you'll have to decide which is better for your case. Okay, so uh, one of the great things that it helped us was we decided to change URLs. How often do you change your URLs on the site? Anybody like, sometimes never, like, I think my average is like once a year. And I've disguised the tests, so this are, I've changed the URLs and stuff like that, but okay, we had, okay, I didn't change the scenario, okay. 
Ah. Skip that, that small detail. So you're on a product with the old URL, then the URL should be that and I should see the product title. This will test if your redirect is redirecting from your old URLs to new ones. It can be great if you're doing some Apache rewrites, don't do them, but if you want to. Uh, to test your application logic, it's really hard to get into Firefox and, okay, take one old URL, then test if it's working, then another one, then you change some code and Firefox remembers that 301 and 302 and your code actually doesn't work, but it redirects. Won't happen with this. So, this is a custom step. So, uh, here the biggest point, so, uh, and I should be on is a normal step. But I had some issues and I wanted to have a step that's called then URL is. The main difference is that the first one uh, destroys the query strings. So it removes the query strings and sometimes I actually need to test that they exist. So I've just built my own step and this is it. This is the piece of PHP code to do it. This is a comment, check that URL is equal to specified. This is the annotation that you would be using in the, in the Behat test. It will match, uh, Behat will match them directly. This is the variable I'm using. I get it, I add the local path, check the actual URL if they are not, if they are not exactly the same, I throw an exception. That's it, that's a new step. I want the custom step, I've built it. So, fellow SEO something something decided that we should do another change of URLs. And I was up for it. He was working on it, I was pretty sure that I've already covered most of the cases with tests and he was like, I don't care, we have tests, you, you'll, you're gonna break them. He actually did break them, but it, tur but it turned out that those tests showed him some edge cases that he wouldn't think of. And to be honest, I forgot about them. And that, that was it. Add a new test, fix the old test, so if somebody, if somebody had the old URL, let's say in uh, someone in the forum, maybe on in some email or something, they will be redirected to the right page. That's it. Or you can fix wrong slugs. Uh, Sometimes when you have user-generated content or something, slugs do change, like let's say if you're a media company like newspapers or something, you change the title, you want your URL to change. So put a test that says that whatever this is, checks that the URLs, the slugs are right, then URL is the right one, just using the ID. That's it. You, you can actually add some unit tests and stuff like that. But. So for me always, these redirections were the hardest thing to test because I would have to find them, copy paste them, have them in a notepad or somewhere, close Firefox, open Firefox, stuff like that. This way is just running out of box and I really don't care. You can check if like there's a 404 if there's no product or brand and something like that. All of this is coming with the mink context by default. So, okay, <laughs> blah, 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 you've been doing some redirects, who cares? Okay, I'm stepping up with what's happening. So, given I'm on a search, I select from the category Dropbox, the category one, I press search, I should see on the next page we have found 40 products and URL is something. So if you're using the, the page is something, it will disregard this part. And that's why I had to change them. It would otherwise always tell you true because it would just remove them. Okay, let's do something more complicated. Select from a drop-down, fill in some, uh, 
given some input text, run search, check that the URL is what you want. So why I'm showing you this, this is a custom built search engine. We were building it like six months ago or something and it was done all by using all kinds of testing methods to get it right. And this is my second search engine building, well, not search engine as Google search engine. And this one was much less pain because I was able to, at every moment, test what's happening. I do a breakage, I check what did it break. Okay, it broke this, okay, let's fix it. Is it running now? Okay, let's go forward. Okay, all of those tests were running without JavaScript. My fellow front-end developer decided to use a lot of JavaScript on the search engine. And we had to run it in browser. So here is another custom step that I had to add because when you would click some brand, it would trigger an a AJAX request that would get an HTML and then inject it inside. So we had for, to wait for AJAX to actually process. I'll, I'll show you how it's done, it's really easy. And go further. <coughs> okay, we have a registration form. Uh, it's similar to login, nothing really special. But as you see, the first step is the custom one, because if without it, it would start breaking on the second iteration because it would already have a user with an email example.com. So if you're trying to test things like that, it's actually good to uh, add some ad additional custom tests or just try to add some kind of a timestamp or something like that. that. That might fix it too. Okay. My fellow front-end developer decided to build a whole booking, buying something in Angular. And that's a bitch to test. It takes like five minutes to just run through the whole process and fill everything in. So, again, we used scenarios to test it. Every freaking step. And it's a multi-step scenario. So, you're on some product, Okay, there's an expectation that you are logged in here because we didn't want to test again that you are that you have to be logged in. So I'm on some product. I click buy it. I wait for Ajax to work. I'm on the some details page. I should see some title, how much it costs, just to verify that I'm on the right page with some right information here. Actually, this test has a lot of a lot more details, but I couldn't fit them all in, so I just removed some of them. Then I, con then I press continue to payment plan, then I'm back again waiting for Ajax. Okay, now I'm on the third page. Okay, I'm on the payment page, I see 20 euros, I fill in my credit card details, I select from the drop down menu menus month and year, I enter the security, how it's the CVX something, complete the purchase button, I'm on the thank you page, and that's it. I know that the booking, that the buying process works. It's a four-step process. Running it actually by hand takes like five to six minutes. Running it like this takes like half a minute. And you can run like 20 of them. And just go for a coffee, lunch, or whatever you, you prefer to do instead of standing in front of your browser. So, that custom step I was talking about and I wait for the Ajax request process. It waits for 10 seconds or until there's a variable Ajax process flag set to one, whichever happens first. Usually the process takes like three to four seconds, but we wanted to be sure that 10 seconds, we added some Ajax process flags to manipulate the testing behavior and that's it. We have JavaScript more or less done. Okay, so now that I've shown some of the features, you can do much more. Uh, you can upload images, you can test, uh, you can upload images which was really cool for me for one 
one of my pet projects because it's usually okay browse find the freaking image somewhere test does it work huh, no okay let's do it again so Behat has feature files the idea is that one feature is defined in one file they are usually located in features folder and each file has a feature extension okay so what does it consist of it says it has a feature definition it says what this feature is then you can have some background tasks like uh, okay I'll explain them it's it's an optional feature if you want and then you do your scenarios so a feature definition is user login that you can say in order for users to update content if you are running like a CMS or if you're running an e-commerce site you want your users to buy stuff you say as a user and that's a pretty uh, important thing so here you can do a distinction between a user a customer an admin person a customer support something like that and have them there have them have different roles in the whole process <coughs> but you'll have to in that case have a different file because this feature is definition for the whole file okay I need to log in so you can define the background tasks they will run on each scenario before it so it's really cool if you want to test let's say how the admin backend uh, works and instead of instead of logging a user on each scenario you just say okay before running this scenario log in the user in and then does this button work can somebody do this can somebody do that okay scenarios it's just a list of what I've already shown you the idea is to have as many as you can to try to ex explain that okay check that login is accessible from home page maybe from the product page check that login works check that login fails gracefully when there's a wrong password or something like that so okay how do we run Behat? okay oh sorry I forgot to mention it. are there any questions or every is everybody scared or understanding everything let's do scared scared uh, as rest or XML or what not too much it's not meant for like okay I access this XML and then something because there's no behavior in it you can do it you just add like a custom step that says that runs through the XML and says okay is there this element that element or something but it's not behavior it, it would probably make more sense for something like soap but I don't know how many people are happy to do some soap so no. I have really nice memories of those days so okay this is all you have to run it you have your features in the features folder you just run bin behat it will run all of them you can separate them by type just put them in the feature in the like do a product uh, folder user folder backend folder whatever however you want to organize them and then just run all of them inside or you can run some exact one this is the way to just run the suit that I said so it's the suit goes over the different files and connects them together oh shit really Ivan, I need internet. <laughs> it says disconnected. I thought it's going to load everything. Yeah, no. 
Yeah, I'm trying it. Why did I have to use images? <laughs> Isn't it? Android No? Android AP. This is what you'll see in your command line. Uh, maybe Mills. Uh, can you turn off the lights? Thank you. So in this case, I'm just running two scenarios from one feature file that, and it will actually show you every step it's gonna be green if the step was done right and everything else it has a summary on the end that it run that many scenarios with that many steps and in how much time so this was like three seconds and take into consideration that this wasn't checking the local site it was checking actually that demo on the web uh, okay uh, in this case, as you can see a bit in the red here, I broke something. So I've added like 10 different scenarios or something like that. I, I, I said that username is going to be admin1 just to break it and to show you that it's gonna say that, okay, but current page is login, but slash was expe expected. So this is more than enough to see that, like what's gonna happen if you enter a wrong username. And in the end, in the summary, in the error report, it's gonna say, okay, in the features, login feature file on the line 13, it failed. And the summary says how, ma how much of what was being run. You can also run it in a, a bit, for me, a bit better uh, printer. So this is a dot for each step, if, and if it fails, it's just gonna sh say where it failed. Unfortunately, you can't see here that it says feature login feature 19, because it's in a bit of gray. So I prefer this way instead of having like five uh, screens of text to go through. Okay, so my suggestions are tag your feature scenarios, uh, especially with like work in progress that can save you like a lot of time when developing because especially if you start developing new things you just put in like five new uh, new tests five new scenarios tag the ones you're working on as work in progress run them when you're done with them remove them remove the VIP from them move to the next set uh, use fixtures uh, Sometimes it's really hard to run tests 
uh, on like live database things like uh, or using a dump from the production why uh, data changes through time and so let's say you're testing if search is working correctly and you have like let's say 100 products and when you put a price filter in you start expecting to see like 50 of them but then you get the new database from the production the data changes you have to change all of the tests and that can be a bit of a pain but fixtures are really easy to use and just put some test data in set up a continuous integration server so we've been running we've been using github and circle ci we just each team member just goes to circle ci says sign up with github goes to the repository says connect it with ci so whenever we do a push to our uh, forks it runs the test on the ci and if something fails it sends you an email okay this failed so sometimes i would be just writing some code before lunch i would just ship that to my fork so just so the tests would run while i'm on lunch or a coffee break or something i would come back and it's all done that's it so some of the code examples and ideas you can find them here i see that it's a really short link uh, also another great uh, resource that I've been using to find some house how to's for Behat is Cilius. They have really great uh, boilerplate code, let's say, that you can fetch some ideas from and how to stuff and use it. Questions? Have you used Procession? No, but I've been to Lucas free lectures of it. Uh, on the functional side, uh, if I c remember correctly, you still have to write those scenarios in some kind of PHP file and say run or something and then the text, which might confuse people. Like, would your clients react very well if you send them like that? They can be exported in Gherkin. Okay, great. But how, can you import from Gherkin? Uh, I think no. And sometimes you might want your somebody else to write them. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, any more questions? So did I scare everybody shitless or are you like tired or I was boring or mm, it's not English uh, if you have any questions okay you use the no but it shouldn't be hard to uh, integrate it because I think the Selenium can run the Phantom JS. So all you have to actually set up is Selenium and uh, Phantom JS. So that's it. It should it shouldn't be any hassle. It'll be quicker than Yeah, but can it produce screenshots? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>